Hello everyone and welcome back to another video. So this is going to be a relatively quick video or at least I'll try to make it one so let's just jump into it. Recently as of April 10th 2024 a new study has been published to the Journal of American Medical Association. The study titled quote oral minoxidil versus topical minoxidil for male androgenetic alopecia a randomized clinical trial unquote conducted by Penha et al. 2024. This study evaluated the efficacy, safety, and tolerability of oral minoxidil compared to topical minoxidil in treating male androgenetic alopecia. So this is a randomized clinical trial that was double-blinded and placebo-controlled, taking place at a specialized clinic in Brazil involving male participants aged 18 to 55 who were treated over a 24-week period, so about six months. For those of you who don't know, placebo-controlled means that there is usually one group that gets a fake treatment. This is the placebo, which in theory should have no clinical effects. But this study did it a bit differently, and I'll explain it later, but essentially there was a placebo topical and a placebo oral. So for example, if you were in the group that was getting the actual treatment for oral minoxidil, they'll give you a placebo treatment for topical minoxidil and vice versa. Again, more on this later. But this type of measurement is very essential because it allows the treatment that we are testing, the thing that we think may have an actual biological impact on a human subject or whatever subject, right? We call that the treatment arm or the treatment group. It allows that to be measured against something we are sure has no sort of biological benefit. In fact, it just has a neutral outcome. If there is a statistical significance where the treatment outperforms the placebo control, then we can say that the treatment seems to work. And the term double blind means that subjects of the study were randomly assigned to either the oral minoxidil group or the topical minoxidil treatment group. And both the subjects and the researchers don't know who belonged to what. Maybe a computer generated that sort of outcome and a third party of some kind knows what group actually belongs to what group. So this ensures results are high quality. So the oral minoxidil group received five milligram daily of oral minoxidil with again that topical placebo while the other group, the topical minoxidil treatment group, got one milliliter of 5% topical minoxidil twice daily, and they were also given an oral placebo. This study is a mixed effect model, and it's very useful because it accounts for what is known as the intra-individual correlations over time, which provides more reliable estimates of the treatment's effects. So what I'm trying to explain here is this. You can imagine the overall design of the study as if you're tracking the growth of plants in a garden. Each plant, like each participant in this clinical trial, grows differently based on several factors, like the type of plant they are, the amount of soil and sunlight and water that they receive. This model also helps make sense of both individual differences and common trends, ensuring that your understanding of the subjects is accurate, even if some subjects are occasionally missed during observation, which is very important because, again, I'm going to touch on this later in the results, about 27% in the oral minoxidil group and 22% in the topical minoxidil group dropped out of the study, so they didn't want to participate anymore. And these can have profound impacts on the overall reliability of the study. So I'm saying all these things just so you guys can understand what's actually going on here. The aim of the study was to see if there were any change in terminal hair density in the frontal and vertex regions of the scalp from baseline to 24 weeks. Secondary outcomes included changes in total hair density and evaluations based on photographic assessments. The researchers used triscopic images analyzed at a specialized lab, which, again, provides an objective assessment of the hair growth outcomes. But blah 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 blah, what were the results here? The findings of the trial revealed no significant superiority of oral minoxidil over topical minoxidil in increasing terminal hair or total hair density in the frontal scalp region. However, in the vertex region, oral minoxidil seemed to show a superior outcome in photographic evaluations, which was statistically significant, being a p-value of 0.04. This suggests a region-specific efficacy of oral minoxidil that might be of clinical interest. So, essentially, what's going on here is, maybe in the vertex region, if you have some thinning there, oral minoxidil may be helpful for you. And come to think of it, there was that five-year long-term oral dutasteride study that came out in Korea, I think last year, and it said that people who had 
sort of thinning in the vertex region, if I'm not mistaken, but it said something along the lines of that, that oral dutasteride at 0 0.5 milligrams tended to work better in those like kind of miniaturized vertex areas. So maybe that's why some people have benefits by using both oral minoxidil and oral dutasteride, and that's probably why they get good results if they're sort of diffuse thinners. But when it comes to side effects, adverse effects were more commonly reported in the oral minoxidil group, with hypertrichosis affecting nearly half of the participants, about 49%, and headaches being another notable complaint. Now, the researchers of this study say that it has also demonstrated that oral minoxidil is safe, that it didn't have any sort of severe adverse effects. And what I'm going to mention here, I'll touch on shortly when I get to the limitation section of this video, but this study had a low sample size, which definitely could make oral minoxidil appear to be safer than it actually is. There's a common study that many people cite to prove how safe oral minoxidil is. In fact, many dermatologists point to this study themselves. This study is titled, quote, Safety of Low-Dose Oral Minoxidil for Hair Loss, a Multicenter Study of 1,404 patients, unquote. This study is retrospective, which means that the data was compiled from existing data rather than from an active study, which is also known as a prospective study. So the prospective study here in this case would be what we just looked at between oral minoxidil at 5 milligram versus topical minoxidil at 5% by Penha et al. But again, let me get back to talking about this 1,404 patient study. The main issue with this study was that it did not establish that the serious side effects of oral minoxidil were dose dependent. So that means, well, if you were to get a very serious side effect, like pericardial fusion, this is a an actual side effect, right, that causes fluid to be built up around the heart, which constricts your heart from pumping correctly and actually can kill you unless they go in there and drain out the fluid in the heart sac. The researchers were not able to confidently say that using low dose oral minoxidil between 0.5 milligram up to 5 milligram would mitigate the serious side effect of, again, pericardial effusion. In fact, the authors directly state that the risk of systemic adverse effects associated with low dose oral minoxidil was unrelated to dose, age, or sex and that low-dose or minoxidil may be influenced by idiosyncratic patient characteristics. They also reference a study from the 1980s which found that the idiosyncratic or individual-specific nature of oral minoxidil side effects resulted in the deaths of eight people in a subject population of 1,869. There, again, no dose could adequately predict who would get serious side effects, so there's no dose dependency it is dose independent. This shows that for serious side effects, it's really the patient's genetics that would determine a side effect like pericardial fusion. Now, if I had a guess personally, there's probably some sort of threshold where if you take a certain dose, you could trigger this deadly side effect. But what is typically deemed low dose oral minoxidil, so 0.5 milligram up to 5 milligram, has been noted in case reports to cause pericardial effusion. And I'll put some on the screen over here. I'll touch on this at the end of the video, but I'm suspecting that it does have something to do with the individual's sulfora transferase activity. So maybe if somebody has a very high sulfora transferase enzymatic activity in the body, this could be a predictor of somebody getting pericardial effusion. But this is just a working theory, and I think the researchers also mentioned that as well. But stay tuned at the end of the video, I'll talk more about this. So in studies, we have these things called limitations. And for those of you who don't know, limitations are essentially problems with a study that cause it to maybe not have the highest quality of data. And from that, you can't have the best or highest quality outcomes. And this study definitely had some big limitations. The most obvious limitation here would be the sample size of the study. So that's how many subjects or participants were in this study. There were a total of 90 trial participants, however, towards the end of the study, due to dropouts like I mentioned earlier in this video, only 68 people remained. And with that relatively small sample size, in fact one that gradually was shrinking, the confidence intervals for some key findings were wide, indicating uncertainty around the true effect size. Larger studies could provide more definitive conclusions and possibly reveal smaller effects that the study was underpowered to detect.
And also that 27% dropout rate in the oral minoxidil group and 22% in the topical minoxidil group definitely could lead to biased results. But I think they were able to mitigate that with using that mixed effect model. So kudos to the researchers there. So in conclusion, while the study by Penha et al. 2024 did not find the overall superiority of oral minoxidil 5 mg especially over topical minoxidil 5% in enhancing hair density in male androgenetic alopecia, it did highlight a possible advantage in the vertex region of the scalp, and this suggests a potential for a tailored approach depending on the area of hair loss. Look, we know that people typically take oral minoxidil when they feel as if they're not good responders to topical minoxidil because of potentially not having enough of that sulforotransferase enzyme, also known as SALT1A1 human enzyme in their hair follicles. Remember, this enzyme is the key predictor to determine whether or not somebody responds to oral and topical minoxidil because it turns minoxidil into minoxidil sulfate, which is responsible for growing hair. The liver is thought to have enough of this enzyme, which could turn a topical minoxidil non-responder into a minoxidil responder by using the sulforotransferase in the liver to disperse minoxidil sulfate throughout the body, eventually reaching the hair follicles of the scalp. But even the amount of sulforotransferase enzymatic activity in the liver is genetically determined. So this means that there is a possibility that some people may not have an adequate amount of sulforotransferase enzyme in their liver, which can turn minoxidil into minoxidil sulfate. For this fact, we can look at a very small gene study on women, but it's also useful, titled, quote, Minoxidil Sulforotransferase Enzyme, SALT1A1, Genetic Variance Predicts Response to Oral Minoxidil Treatment for Female Pattern Hair Loss, unquote, where cheek swab tests were used to check the genetic proclivity of a high sulforotransferase enzyme and to see whether or not people would get that oral minoxidil response being hair growth. I would assume that gene tests could also be used to rationalize that those with higher sulforotransferase enzymatic activity may also be likely to have higher side effects or just very severe side effects. Now, I'm just loosely basing this claim off of all the research that I looked at just now in this video as well. But of course, we would need a larger and more robust study to come to that conclusion. That conclusion being, well, maybe people who have abnormally high sulforotransferase activity shouldn't be using oral minoxidil because it could lead to them having pericardial effusion and other serious side effects. And that's something I wish the Penha et al. 2024 study had, which I think would kind of bolster their claim on safety and efficacy when it comes to oral minoxidil and topical minoxidil even, right? If they had more gene testing or adequate improved gene testing, it could have made this study better. And of course, keeping that mixed effect data, but also incorporating a higher subject count definitely would have made that study very, very good. But I think there's enough here to hint that oral minoxidil is kind of overhyped, that it really doesn't make that much of a difference. The people who are responders to topical minoxidil are probably just going to respond better to oral minoxidil. And there could be reasons as to why people may not recognize their topical minoxidil gains if they are theoretically good responders to both. And that could just be due to how they apply it to the scalp, being very infrequent with their use, or just really that oral treatments have a higher concentration and it's much more likely to reach more of that sulforotransferase in the hair follicles and also from the liver as well. So you're kind of getting a double whammy here. But that's just my thoughts. And that's pretty much it for this video. If you got this far, comment in the comment section below. Orange apples. Thanks for watching. And I hope to see you on the next video. Peace out.